So um, uh, before I address some concrete points from the previous presentations, uh, and I actually also thank to our presenters for very thought-provoking and inspiring presentations, uh, I would like to prepare the ground, so to say, and pinpoint some conceptual uh, knots uh, actually uh, uh, emerges in, 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 in Rada's book. And one of these knots, uh, it actually uh, occurred also yesterday uh, during the discussion, and I found it really, really important, important topic, if not the topic of every uh, discourse on the politics of translation, it is the relation between violence and translation. And I think this relation is somehow also in the ground of, uh, of, of uh, our three presentations today. So um, I would like to uh, have this approach through through the through the through the problem of violence, and uh, immediately to radicalize the, this this problem, I would say that um, uh, that in the current epistemological order, so to say, uh, translation violence are both the victims of the same ideological mechanism, or the victims of the same ideological production of meaning, which results in a certain abstraction and in certain moraliza moralization. So. Uh, we have an uh, abstract and moralistic concept of violence, which actually corresponds totally to moralistic vision of translation as something that is non-violent, intrinsically pacific, communicative, bridging uh, of the cultural differences and so on. And according to me, this, uh, this is the signal, uh, this, this, this moralization is a signal of the processes of uh, depolitization. Uh, the problem of violence and, 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 and translation is, is also interesting. It can be approached through uh, one author. Uh, it is Walter Benjamin. Um, uh, and it is interesting to know that in the same year in which Benjamin writes his uh, essay uh, on, on the task of the translation, trans, trans, task of the trans, uh, trans, translator, uh, he actually works, or, or, or actually he already finished his another famous text, that is text on critique of violence, so critique the Gewalt in which he differentiates various forms of violence. And usually these two, two, uh, these two texts are not uh, read together even among Benjaminian scholars, which is a little bit odd. And it is interesting to also to know that what Benjamin does in his text on violence is that actually uh, from the beginning to the end, he translates German word Gewalt, which as we know, doesn't mean only violence, but also force, power, uh, control, and so on. So Benjamin is, uh, is translating and some translation of Gewalt is internal element of the composition of his critique of violence. And he's translating actually German into German. So why I'm saying all this, uh, because if for Benjamin translation is the very operation by means of which the critique of violence is produced, I would like to invert the problem and ask the following question. That is, do we need a critique of violence in order to produce the concept of translation? So is it necessary to deal with violence in every praxis of translation? So even when we, when we don't make it explicit, there is always uh, an underpinning representation of violence in the mode we consider translation. Uh, I think the uh, answer here is affirmative and uh, we can here apply a rule or, 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 or a sort of motto and say, uh, tell me how do you understand translation, and I will tell you what do you mean when you say violence. Uh, so it is very probable that if somebody has a moralistic <laughs> concept of translation, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, also the, the 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 vision of violence will be uh, in, in the same in the same terms. So there is a structural analogy between translation and 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 violence, and. Um, for example, in Rada's book, when she's discussing the the the, the de violence, which uh, the concept of de violence, which is actually very like in a Croatian translation, razna silje, so it almost sounds very violent when when you pronounce it. And uh, the, there is a the, uh, the the this issue that uh, both violence and translation actually resist to be, to be reduced to certain dichotomy. So for example, when we speak about translatability and untranslatability, which is everlasting topping of every theory of translation, we are actually not operating with simply oppositional terms. So being untranslatable does not block the process of translation. 
So on the contrary, it makes it possible. So translation happens not despite the untranslatable, but rather in force of it. And also vice versa, as we, as, as we saw yesterday with, with Sakai, the untranslatable exists only in and after translation. So the same, the same thing is similar um, is with violence. Violence is not simply opposed to nonviolence. They are mutually dependent and each one arises from the ground of the, of the other. So both concepts must be taught together in their mutual dependence. And, uh, and to this same order of concepts, such as translation and violence, uh, yeah, actually I would here refer to, uh, to, to Boris' title and say, there is not only genus phase of translation, but also genus phase of violence as well. And as I said, to this order of, 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 of concepts, such as translation and violence, I would, but I don't have now time to elaborate it, maybe for discussion, I would add another concept which is, has a similar value, it is the concept of hegemony. It, it will be, after also, the topic of Radha's uh, presentation. Because hegemony understood in the Gramscian terms, which exactly has this genus phase of being both consent, uh, acceptance, and force, or violence, or power to use the force. So uh, uh, why uh, um, I need all this, uh, actually, because uh, I need this allows me to find a thread between three presentations because the question of appro cultural appropriation from Nadezhda's talk, the question of different narrative of incest in Nivedita's talk, and also the question of war and 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 uh, repressive neo-vernacularization from Buddhist talks, they are all strictly connected to how we understand violence. Uh, so uh, now I will. Yeah, I uh, just to check the yeah okay uh, yeah now I will pass to the to the, the let's say the concrete concrete more more concrete questions uh, the question of cultural appropriation from Adesda Stoke uh, I, I, I somebody said I agree with the question <laughs> I agree with the need to raise the question can or should we condemn cultural appropriation we can put this question also in terms of violence because the question is is and how the cultural appropriation is the synonym uh, of violence, especially in that form of violence that perpetuates dominant uh, power relations. I have impression that uh, the concept of appropriation is culturalized, and as this culturalization of the concept of appropriation made it uh, as a synonym of colonization or assimilation. But uh, maybe we can save something from appropriation, or to say to reappropriate appropriation from a more political than a cultural uh, perspective. Um, and um, because if we speak here about translation, uh, the question is whether translation as such is possible at all without at least a minimal involvement of appropriation. Because if we lose appropriation as this element, we lose possibility to establish relation. And without relation, there is no translation. And without translation, there is no, uh, there is no politics. So. Uh, and even if we uh, adopt that violence is, is intrinsic to each appropriation, uh, maybe we could, by analogy with the concept of the violence that I already mentioned, maybe we can conceptualize rather something like the appropriation, which is not, according to the same logic, which is not contrary to the appropriation. So even the appropriation appropriates in its own way, but appropriates as a counter hegemonic appropriation that counteracts colonial assimilation of the other nights by producing relation with the foreign. So maybe that will be my first question, uh, the, the differentiate cultural and political aspect of, of appropriation. Uh, and the, actually there are many interesting processes of political appropriation in, uh, that are evident in language and in translation practice. Now I don't have time to go into detail. Uh, I have some. I had something actually about concept of hybridity and uh, uh, and its political capacities of this problem, but I will. Uh, I, I don't have time. Maybe in the discussion. Um, and yeah, concerning Nivedita's talk, uh, I um, I would like to dwell on the question of precise question that you asked, uh, can global South be universalizable? You know, in what sense differential elements of other cultures in global South, so other conceptions, traditions, narratives are not only peculiar to particular culture, but have or can have a 
and universal validity. And this is the question of universality. That's the question I want to pose. How we understand universality? And I would like if we can elaborate more on this in the, in the, in the, during the rest of, of, of our discussion, because um, your analogy or distinction that I really like between psychoanalysis in the South and from the South uh, gave me one idea that maybe we can speak of the universality to, to actually to distinguish two types of universality, universality in a location and universality that speaks from one location. For example, the examples uh, that Nivedita uses for the alleged universality of Oedipus complex uh, suggests that uh, this type of universality consists in searching uh, the relative equivalences in other cultures of this complex or discovering the similar patterns that confirm the original but I, I think that we exactly have to challenge this concept of universality. This would be kind of universality in a location, you know, that, that, the universality that actually is just transplanted to another uh, cultural context. But if we maybe try to think universality from the location, and maybe I would like to propose here the concept of translational universality, drawing upon Balibar's work, that is universality that is not that is established not as an imposition of one particularity over another uh, particularity, but universality exactly as this translational process from a particular location. So very concrete contextualized uh, universality. Um, and for this, actually, I have one example. Uh, it's not from psychoanalysis. Uh, it's, um, exam it's an example of uh, Chinese translation of Marx and Engels' manifest of the Communist Party. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not uh, expert on this, but I read some studies. It's a very interesting topic about 20 different translations, so con continuous retranslations of manifest uh, uh, manifesto in the last 100 years in Chinese, um, which actually follows all the history not only of Chinese language but also the history of Chinese social transformation from semi-feudal society to capitalist society. So universality, uh, uh, I would locate exactly in this constant retranslations as living process that is open in this case between Marxist, Marx texts, Chinese language and Chinese social uh, reality. Uh, so in this case, we don't need to search a common pattern that confirm original, but we have producing of something new. So, um, that's the that's the that's the will be uh, the question from uh, that's um, uh, from Nivedita's you know the question of universality, but uh, also the question of universality somehow emerges in 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 Boris' presentation even though Boris you don't speak about universality but you speak about the question of building, and uh, this question whether heterolingual address is capable of capable of building actually I read uh, in these terms whether heterolinguality is capable of universality. Um, so um, as we know, the you mentioned Humboldt and, and, and the German Roman romanticism, the building was the, 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 the instrument of, of universalization, or this idea of Erhebung to Allgemeinheit. Uh, from, from Herder Goethe to Hegel, they all, they all shared this vision of the building as universalization. But uh, this question of universal universality through building is also the question of the possibility of political formation. So what is the political for formulation of heterolinguality? What are the political subjects of heterolinguality? And I would, my question would be about this, uh, about the heterolinguality. Um, toward the end uh, of your talk, you mentioned heterolingual difference. But I would rather go into the direction of something like differential heterolinguality. So my question is, if it's necessary, to historicize translation as act, as a practice, as we saw yesterday with uh, Naoki Sakai, would it be necessary also to historicize the very heterolinguality. So the difference between old vernacular and new vernacular goes in this direction. But uh, I have impression that sometimes heterolinguality is defined as a merely negative counterpart of homolinguality. So heterolinguality is what is non-homolingual but historically considered there are different historical forms of heterolinguality or shall we differentiate socially, politically heterolingualities in order to speak about feminist heterolinguality or subaltern heterolinguality about the forms of heterolinguality that conforms to the dominant order. Uh, so the, the, 
I think that if we not differentiate heterolinguality, there is a risk that we produce a new scheme or new binary division between homolingual and heterolingual, which is exactly not the aim of all the process. Um, so uh, yeah, that would be uh, that would be the, 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 the my concept, the possibilities of one differential hetero heterolinguality. Um, and if I have just a few seconds, half of the minute, I want to something about to say about uh, Ukraine and the revolution because it's always good to finish with the revolution. <laughs> and uh, um, and this actually in this way I'll go back to my initial consideration on violence. Uh, Actually, I would like to borrow the title of one, of one Boris text that is published recently, uh, Only Revolution Ends the War. That was the title of text. And I would like to modify this uh, uh, title in Benjaminian terms, in terms of, 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 of violence, and say, uh, 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 yes, only revolutionary violence articulated as a certain politics of translation uh, ends the war violence. So this would be exactly uh, a kind of radical counter hegemonic project of ending the war by ending its real cause. And its real cause is capitalist mode of production and imperialism. But <laughs> for that, actually we need a new, uh, some kind of Lenin uh, 2.0 and uh, it's, it's not so easy. And it is interesting to see how in these two identity blocks that uh, Buden Boris uh, 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 distinguishes. Lenin is really the missing figure and the real meeting point uh, between these two sides in the war because both sides are ideologically premised on the erasure of Leninist past and of re uh, revolutionary past. Um, so yes, the, maybe it's better now to leave the, yeah, and to say something maybe in the discussion more about uh, this topic of Ukraine and war, which is very important, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all for your presentations and thanks Sasha for, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the role of the discussant. As an Anglo-Saxon student, I, you know, very much adopted this idea that you should be merciful to your audience. So I open the floor to discussion. We can, we can extend the time, but just a little bit, because we have another panel and we have a closing panel that Radha is chairing, for which I kindly invite you to join and to be as fresh and as vocal as possible. So just just uh, maybe 10 minutes after 12, we can finish. Please, I open the floor for discussions, comments, questions about these three very, very interesting and very broad papers in, in terms of subject. Rada raised her hand. Do you see that? Yes. Rado, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you. I have unmuted myself and I'm looking for my notes because I took some notes, uh, but I needn't uh, speak uh, the first if uh, uh, there is anyone quicker here. Uh, John, John. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, since uh, this is a, a question addressed to Sasha and Boris, uh, and I, my apologies to the other two presenters, I couldn't think of a way of uh, articulating it to their presentations. Um, this is a reflection on the, if we're talking about uh, war, revolution, war and revolution and translation, war, revolution, violence and translation, um, I'd like to uh, ask about the relation between translation and conspiracy. Uh, I ask that particularly in reference to uh, the example that Boris gave of Wikipedia and the inequality in Wikipedia's uh, between different language versions of Wiki Wikipedia. I think it's probably, I hope it's probably well known among everybody here that Wikipedia is a well, it, it is an astroturfed, uh, you know, CIA cutout. <laughs> it cooperates. It's well documented, and it cooperates. There is a, a there is a well documented cooperation with uh, intelligence agencies <clears throat> behind Wikipedia. Um, just to take a step back, because maybe some people will feel like this is going too far. It's important to remember that also in the current context, there are plenty, huh? There are plenty of voices 
who consider any attempt at a deconstruction of the West to be a conspiracy theory, <laughs> right? I mean, this is part of the discourse of the sort of neo-fascist extreme right in Europe and North America today, right? That there's this conspiracy to um, destroy the West. <clears throat> This, I think, falls into, um, this is another response to uh, Boris's presentation, right? His uh, a citation of Rancière and, and, and the ignorant schoolmaster Jacques Rousseau. Uh, and he's very critical of what he calls the pedagogical presupposition where you imagine that you have some knowledge that has to be communicated to the other to enlighten them. Um, and this is why he, he, for him, he identifies the idea of emancipation as um, in a text where in a text where he's talking about what communism means, uh, and he defines a, a emancipation as being where one is not supposed to be and doing what one cannot do, uh, which I think in some ways is a really lovely uh, definition of what translation is. <laughs> it's a lovely definition of translation. And I think, especially in the sense that translation always, the practice of translation always includes an element of non-knowledge, something that goes beyond knowledge, but that's always being appropriated into a representation, uh, a representational schema. That's a, another big lesson that I draw from uh, Naoki Sakai's work. Uh, I would love to hear either of uh, Boris or Sasha then take that and discuss the way that consensus and conspiracy today is blurred precisely uh, through uh, a manipulation of translation, usually in the form of this idea that the foreigners are infiltrating our society. <laughs> Thank you. Shall I directly um, respond to you? Yeah, um, you know, you uh, uh, mentioning Ranciere and uh, and conspiracy. Just to remind you that the introduction into uh, um, into the the ignorant schoolmaster wrote Christine Ross. She also wrote the uh, book Fast Cars and Clean Bodies. Which is about which is about the the involvement of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, intelligence agencies before all, of course, CIA into the creation epistemological uh, condition of the Europe, especially France after the Second World War, which means uh, uh, orchestrated investment into the uh, anal school of history, you know, Brodel, so as to remove from the, from the consciousness or from the uh, uh, epistemological um, uh, uh, dealing with, 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 with history to remove the idea of abrupt, sudden change which was called revolution. So to, to exclude it, instead, you know, we got some sort of a, a, a long-term mentality change, what we call relative eternity, et cetera, et cetera, which is directly, you know, something similar to area studies. And you say, yes, we, since we are weak, we cannot fight CIA. Uh, not even by, by, by spreading the knowledge and awareness of its involvement into our cognitive and ep epistemological uh, 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 matters, practice, what we do, what we think. They are already, they are already there. Um, uh, I have no uh, uh, answer to this, to this question. Um, I can only do what I have already done, which is you know, to mention it, to, to raise this question. You have raised this question, but um, um, conspiracy uh, is obviously, you know, it, it has its tautolo tautology, uh, tel sorry, teleology, not <laughs> teleology, 
and I named this. This is this is the the the, the gener uh, um, establishment of the new nomos. I called it as uh, the 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 process, uh, violent process of the new uh, realignment uh, with the identity block. And this is what uh, conspiracy of the states, not of the of the masses, you know. This is why it functions so perfectly. And this is why this conspiracy needs a vernacular condition in which populism thrives so well. It is post enlightenment. It is, you know, you don't use your reason and you, you need some tutelage. You need some, you know, Trump to show you the way. So this is just a short answer, but we can discuss it later. Thanks, that was really great, very brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rada, can you unmute yourself? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for these three papers, which were really engaging and uh, absolutely interesting. Um, uh, I will try to uh, only ask a few uh, questions. Uh, Nivi, about uh, your uh, paper, which I promised to read after the conference, uh, I was wondering about uh, uh, one concept that you use and we all use all the time without defining it, the global south. You see, uh, the global, you seem to, uh, the global south seems to be uh, geographic, uh, in uh, much of what you said, uh, but uh, Boaventura has a definition of an epistemological uh, uh, global south, uh, of epistemological uh, positions. And uh, the nuance uh, he introduces, I thought, uh, was not bad. I would like to know what you think about it. And then, of course, you seem to think, and this is what I know from your other work, that um, an analysis or critique of a culture can only be done from within, uh, 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 with authority from within, otherwise it is not valid. Um, so if uh, uh, the Global South is not an epistemic, but a geographical uh, 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 a position uh, that complicates uh, the thing, you see. Um, and then uh, I had, uh, I have a question about my old friend uh, Sudhir Kakar, uh, because uh, um, I suppose uh, you uh, would, I'm not sure because I haven't re read your paper, you would, uh, um, uh, um, you would uh, place him uh, within those who uh, uh, use um, uh, psychoanalysis, uh, Western psych psychoanalysis by only reversing uh, 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 myths or reversing uh, 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 the story. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, uh, Sutir <laughs> has, uh, this was long ago, I haven't uh, read him, although I have contacts every now and then, but I haven't read him, I think, for some 25 years, uh, he has a, a work about the difference of uh, the family in India and uh, uh, in Freud <laughs> and the implications. And he, he also has some uh, work, of course, on the mythology that you used, including on uh, uh, Oedipus, uh, how Oedipus doesn't, doesn't work uh, uh, in India, and he has exactly the same arguments as you. But uh, I understand that uh, uh, Sudhir's work may be uh, uh, problematic. I don't know more about it, and I leave it there. Um, and uh, Nadezhda, I want to thank you uh, uh, for your uh, how shall I say, uh, uh, whenever Nadezhda speaks, uh, what I uh, love in, in her manner is uh, the skepticism and uh, the uh, thinking process that we see, right? And the, uh, 
uh, her uh, modesty in a way, uh, which is uh, the way she works and the way she is. Uh, this uh, thing about appropriation, which was also uh, raised by, which was raised by you and then commented by, by Sasha, I thought it was a settled question uh, because uh, culture feeds on other cultures all the time. And uh, it feeds on uh, hybridity, it produces hybridity and so on. It's a, it's a living organism. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't think we have, I don't know what you mean, uh, you think about it, but uh, uh, I don't think we have a, we can find a, a limit of how much appropriation and how, mu how much is too little or too much. And what uh, really happens when historic achievements are transferred, that is complicated, but we have been living uh, in the Balkans through it uh, over these uh, 40, uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, uh, I leave it there uh, and uh, I'll, I have maybe one or two questions for uh, Boris. I, th I thought that uh, in any case, the vernaculars, you have been speaking about vernaculars for some years now. Uh, the problem is that you can actually never distinguish be between a vernacular and a language, uh, a, a certified language, uh, because it will come out like, uh, you know, the relation between dialects and, and languages, so-called dialects and uh, languages. And then about uh, East-West, uh, you may have uh, seen uh, uh, Jay Hyun's uh, <laughs> book, last book, uh, Global East, Remembering, Imagining, Mobilizing. Uh, I thought it was a good uh, uh, way of decentering our uh, Western and European um, view on the East-West relation, because East-West is not only Eastern and Western Europe, and it is not only capitalism and socialism. It is also uh, Asia uh, and uh, the West and other parts of the world and, uh, you know, uh, in the West and so on, or the North. Uh, so uh, about the former East-West, former East, former West, there are other meanings too than the one you proposed. And then uh, there is this uh, 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 very seducing idea that you raise every now and then, and especially lately, especially on the paper on, on Ukraine, which had a lot of success. I have been giving your, uh, your, your email to people who, who asked me uh, about uh, you. Uh, revolution. It is very seducing, right? Uh, but you never give a, a definition of the revolution. We don't know what revolution is. Revolution is a uh, uh, transcendent thing. And uh, uh, it is problematic in many ways. Uh, it is uh, problematic also in the, the media of, <laughs> of thinking. It has its history. You mentioned Guy Petrovich, okay. Uh, okay, but, uh, and there is a longer history of, of, of the revolution. What we know of revolutions uh, uh, over our lifetime experience and the, the, the lifetime experience of our parents and our grandparents is that uh, revolutions have been violent. Right. Now, there is no guarantee that uh, 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 a reformist uh, approach or evolu evolutionary approach uh, will be nonviolent. Right. This is the problem of violence uh, and deviolence uh, that uh, Sasha mentioned. Uh, uh, but uh, I personally don't go for violence at all uh, anymore unless uh, you. Uh, tell me and you explain 
how your revolution is not going to be violent. Uh, and uh, until you explain that, I'm not interested. Although uh, your uh, proposition is very seducing, I know, and you have a very good way of uh, exposing it. So this was for the three uh, of you. And Sasha, thank you for your uh, uh, discussion. It was all very good and it was a great panel. Thank you. Uh, if you want to, to comment, to respond, uh, you are all we welcome. I don't know. It depends now on the other Sasha, Sasha Pavlovich. Yes. I will give the last word to all three presenters and to Sasha Hernes. Please just wrap it up in a couple of minutes, if possible, if you have some uh, uh, comments or responses. So, should I start? Yes. Should I start? By the oh. order of the end. So, Nivedita, uh, Nadezhda, Boris, and then Sasha. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> I have some um, very big questions, um, so I don't actually see, I, I don't think I'll be able to wrap up as such, but let me just address a couple, address them briefly. So uh, Sasha's question about universalism from the South, I'm glad you picked up on that particular uh, way of putting it, which is not my way of putting it, it's Anubdhar's way of putting it to say in and from. And I think the point that I would stress there is that um, we are moving beyond the mere critique of Eurocentrism and so on now. And we are thinking about how, how comparability happens, how uh, certain kinds of concepts can be universalized. And those concepts could come from the global south. So it's not that the global south is always going to be a space of specificity and difference, but how can some of these concepts speak to um, uh, similar and parallel experiences in other parts of the world? So in other words, this is a way of actually dissolving that north-south binary, even as you stated. Which brings me directly to uh, Radha's question. I'm going to be very brief because I know how short we are of time. Um, so uh, I, I, it's very, it's very. I'm, you said that it sounded as if I was using Global South geographically. Perhaps it sounded like that because I named parts of the globe. Uh, but I do not. Uh, obviously think of the global south as a geographical region or as a category within a developmental discourse. But I think of it as um, uh, a space of thought, a possibility of reevaluating, learning from uh, speech uh, from the margins, right? Uh, reworking the coordinates of intellectual work, that kind of thing. So the idea is to destabilize the east-west distinction that is routinely made. And it also opens up the question of uh, South within the North. So I would, if we're going to talk about the Global South in the way in which I just said it, and uh, uh, you quoted uh, D'Souza as uh, saying, um, using the idea of the epistemological Global South, I'm very much, with, I'm very much within that paradigm. So the thought of African-Americans in the USA or indigenous peoples in Americas and Australia, Dalits and Adivasis in India, that kind of thing. Uh, I would think of uh, a South within the North in that sense. Um, Kakar, um, I did not mention him, uh, as you will notice, largely because they, you know, his work is very, very well known. I was trying to bring into uh, this space some new kinds of work and something that has happened in the last decade uh, in India. <clears throat> but uh, Kakar has also come under, uh, he has some very good um, grounded criticism. There is some good grounded criticism of Kakar. Uh, from a feminist point of view, from a uh, you know, Dalit point of view, his assumption of the Indian self um, as an upper caste male. Uh, so even while he's saying the family is different and ideas of the family are different, which is absolutely, you know, he was one of the uh, first to, to do that kind of work and to rework Indian mythology, uh, not Indian mythology, but this is my point, that he tends to speak of these things as Indian, and so there's uh, now uh, a huge, and this is the point that I wish to raise, that this is not a non-heterogeneous space. So there's a lot of speaking back to the 
hegemon hegemonizing of the global south voice uh, and kakar is very much you know one of the key figures who uh, then comes under criticism i have a, a critique of francais uh, uh, ignorant uh, schoolmaster and it's very tempting to um very briefly talk about it because it has now come up several times but there is a way in which francais considers education and knowledge as entering an already defined space so in that particular format why that works is that um uh, uh, jacoto gives students uh, these books in which you know the the flemish is or uh, uh, it's french and flemish on in on two different columns and they can their intelligence can reveal itself to themselves but um why is he teaching french this is a point which boris brought up why is he teaching french in a flemish speaking region why is a non flemish speaker even teaching in in that region at all these the politics of the nation state and the politics of building that uh, standard language of the nation state is not something uh, that rancier considers at all and he says things like if you remember he says things like do they not know the numbers so if they look at the calendar they are able to uh, make that uh, connection well they had, the peasantry had to learn to enter modernity they had to learn to use that calendar they are learning to enter the new formation of language knowledge cannot be only that so i would if i had to if i had to use a model of pedagogy i would rather use paulo freire than uh, the model of the ignorant schoolmaster but that's a discussion for another day but it does involve translation you it involves translating the other into the self the entire model of the ignorant schoolmaster is how to translate the other into yourself I'm, I, and i've always wondered why rancia did not see that so thank you Um, well, do I have the word? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, uh, just shortly. Um, of course, we have solved uh, for ourselves the question of cultural appropriation, but it's still a political topic. It comes up time and again. And uh, what is the rational, uh, uh, so to uh, aspect of it is that, uh, and that is the answer to uh, Sasha's uh, remark. it is still about the, an asymmetry of power that is uh, even if we if and if we try to uh, distinguish between political and cultural appropriation then we have to uh, explain this kind of diff, of uh, asymmetry of power of course we have all the kinds of uh, vocabulary for that we uh, knew know about uh, cultural cultural and symbolic capital and uh, where to to quote uh, in an approving way and see we know that uh, this kind of things uh, influence the distribution of the sensible that is that the uh, uh, cultural uh, achievements do something in our world they're not just an ornament or or irrelevant but still i i do think that there is a question of power and as i quoted in the, the remarks about from the communist manifesto that uh, Marx and Engels speak about uh, in an approving way about uh, what uh, what is destroyed by the uh, global march of uh, capitalism uh, uh, and then they in this context uh, quote the coming of a world literature it comes obviously at the price that is uh, the uh, of course we i'm not going now into discussion of about the number of languages and the way to save them but i do think there is a uh, the question of uh, power relations because we, as, as we know that the power is a, a sort of tricky thing it's dispersed it comes uh, it appears in uh, uh, unusual ways all over the place and besides i do um, i'm interested in these questions of uh, uh, introduction of something foreign of a sort of uh uh interventions and changes and uh, uh steering up things in a different kind of context so well there is something to be done even if i completely agree uh, uh, uh in my in the way i uh, deal with cultural things that the the the, the sort of uh, constant and open process of producing meanings the hybridity is uh, what we that we want to do 
But again, they are, uh, sometimes it's easier if we uh, speak about the visual and the artifacts and the, all kinds of uh, political demands of institutions, but it still happens on different levels as well. And as I said, I'm, for instance, I don't think that the idea of uh, restituting everything uh, is uh, necessary, is the only way to deal with it. And I really think that uh, an exchange would probably be uh, culturally much more uh, of, a, uh, of a new venture than just trying to give back everything that uh, was stolen. But that's, let me, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Boris, can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes, yes. Is the question of revolution for the closing panel. Okay, <laughs> question of revolution for the closing panel. Uh, shall I say, or the in the world. closing panel? Okay, see you guys in the closing panel. <laughs> or shall I answer like one or two questions? I don't know, we, are, we have run out of time, or? Mm. May I say a few words or not? Few words, yes. Just the revolution. Two. One sentence, yes. One sentence. Rada, no, no. Uh, the, the difference between, um, you know, this is our common language we are speaking now. It is what I call neo vernacular because the institutions of its regulation and standardization no longer exist. Right. And it is, this is what makes it different towards the standardized languages. It is like, you know, um, uh, uh, it's a moment of freedom for all of us. And uh, this is what I uh, uh, think when I say neo-vernacular condition. Possible because, freedom. Yeah, okay. Possible, That's not it. guaranteed freedom, please. Vernaculars are also dead ends uh, very often. Oh, okay. I would now discuss it, but they have their own violence. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Just to mention, you, you know, we, we never mentioned Ivan Illich and this, his concept right. of the vernacular, etc. It is also, you know, he, it's an island branch uh, uh, nearby. I'm speaking from Korchula. It is nearby, but this is another huge topic uh, about uh, education and vernacular condition. Just to mention, okay. Thank you. Sasha, would you like to say a few words? No, I'm just, I also leave the space for the, for the closing panel. So if it's... Great panel. Thank you. Excellent panel. Thank you all for your contributions. And please join us again for the closing panel. I also have, I would like to hear more about evolution. I would like to ask Medita something about the general issue of, of her reading of the Oedipus myth. And thank you all. Have some break and we'll adjourn at 2 p.m. and at 4.30 for the closing panel.